afternoon. Um, the talk today is about Darwin and protocols, um, and as you might expect, it's uh, mostly about DNS. I put up this first slide just to show how much people like identifiers. Those are four of my seven email addresses. I'm sure that most of you out there have many. People want identifiers, and the DNS is the basis of providing most of the identifiers we use today in the internet. Uh, the reason that I'm saying Darwin and protocols is, is that I'm worried about the future of DNS, um, and I either want to replace it with something better, or I want to enhance the DNS that we have. If you want, you can call that DNS version 2 or ENS or whatever. Um, this is a Darwinian problem. It's about survival of the fittest, not necessarily the most beautiful, or the protocol that was endorsed by the International Standards Organization. Um, it's about being able to deal with the environment that we have in the internet and to do even better than it does today. Um, today, most of the discussions so far have been about bright, shiny new protocols, and this is going to be about enhancing an oldster. Um, why am I talking about protocols? Well, I invented the DNS way back when. Um, we have about 30 years of experience about some of these Darwinian factors that have influenced the way that it has grown and I think maybe will help us to think about what to do in the future. I started out on this endeavor about a year ago when ICANN came to me and they said, Paul, we want you to lead a strategic panel. I have been sort of happily sitting in Paris um, thinking about sort of academic issues and worrying about sort of the commercial company. And they said, well, you know, the basis of our operation is DNS. Maybe we ought to think about sort of ways to enhance it. Uh, because if ICANN was a commercial company, and those of you that want to say it is, that's fine. Um, but if you had a third of a billion dollars based upon DNS, you might want to make sure that DNS survives. So they asked me to, to take a look at the strategy for, say, the next decade. And this kind of got me energized about actually thinking about this subject. The present DNS is limited in a number of ways partially by its own success. And what I mean by that is every electronic device that talks to the internet probably talks DNS. I'll let people come up with, accept, uh, with exceptions to that over cocktails. Um, but that means that in order to use DNS, you have to anticipate all of the different variants that are out there, and there's a lot of them. Innovation is, is limited by a lot of the deployment that's already out there, whether it's a firewall or whatever. Um, you know, the protocol, if you go to the IETF and you say, I'm going to introduce some great new enhancement, they go, well, that won't fly with the existing base. Forget it. Go away. Um, in fact, there was a DNS extensions working group that the IETF shut down. All they have left is DNS operations. Um, and the DNS operations people actually are slipping through loopholes in the process. They don't design protocols anymore because that would not be an operational issue. They, des they design mechanisms. And it's OK for them to def design mechanisms that look to me like protocols. Um, but that's kind of where we are today. Um, so you know, can I can do anything about it? And they said, study this problem. And I said, oh, good. You want me to study a problem that I'd like to study anyways? We're on. Um, First thing I had to do was recruit a panel of people that would, at least half of them would disagree with me on a regular basis. Uh, we had the chair of the IETF who didn't appreciate my comments on the IETF process. Um, you know, Paul Vixie who disagrees with me about almost everything and a bunch of other people. Um, but now that I've talked about the panel, I want to say that the rest of this talk is, is pure Paul Marco Petros or tall Paul as we disambiguate the Pauls on the panel. So let's go back to the start, 1983. What was the basis of uh, the original DNS design? Well, first of all, you have to realize that everyone at the time who looked at it said it was much too complicated. I thought it was just enough features so that we could get it off the ground. There was a balance. We left a lot of stuff out intentionally. So when Dan Kaminsky managed to break into the DNS security, he was actually breaking into a door that had no lock, never mind being unlocked. But at any rate, the idea was to grow it. Um, and it was more of a recipe than an invention. People are always saying, well, you didn't invent hierarchies. And I'm saying, well, I'm not sure which pharaoh did. 
but the core values were that simple wins. We, just, we tried to make the protocol look a little bit like sec, set theory meets a tree, and that's the end of the story. Reliable through replication. It's amusing to me that uh, I think this was the first case of a system that just said, no, you have to replicate. Uh, it was completely different from prior efforts where you just retry to a particular high reliability server. Must be inherently fast. Um, and the distribution of authority and control. When people ask me why did this protocol win over the OSI competition and so forth, it was because we enabled people to manage the names in their own network and not have to worry about any central authority. Now, when I would talk about simple ideas, here's my favorite example of a simple idea over on the left. And by the way, I'll pause here because you probably have to edit this part out due to copyright issues. But at any rate, there's uh, the cavemen have invented fire. What a great idea. One great simple idea. It means you can cook food. Life is really good. Um, and then there's Zog over there on the right, and Zog has invented the spit. He has his meat on a stick rather than holding it in his hand. And simple ideas like this, I think, are still out there. I think we could probably come up with innovations in the way that we do naming that are very basic. Another example is over on the right-hand side. It took 40 years from the first airliner to, uh, to actually have jet uh, airlines. Uh, the first airline was in a Zeppelin. You might say, well, gee, that's a very complicated innovation. It took another 40 years after that before people invented the wheelie bag, where you had wheels on the bag that you would bring into the airplane. For 40 years, people were carrying in luggage. There's a lot of simple uh, ideas that are still out there, I believe. So what happened early on? Well, the original RFCs and imp early implementations came out in 83. By a couple or three years later, depending upon some fine points, we had machines that didn't have a host table. I always think that you can tell whether or not something is a production system if people are operating it without the backup of the previous system. We had that in two or three years. I was very happy to see in 86 that the first extension that I didn't write in there the whole idea about mail routing came about. And then we had the final set of specs that are still the base. It turns out that one of the things that I think is wrong with the current DNS is that those specs still stand. Why do they stand? It's because nobody is willing to kind of go through the IETF process to try and rewrite the specs, taking into account everything that we've, we've learned. And because there's literally thousands of pages of fine detail that people have written up and think should be included in the spec. I don't think so. I think you need a simple and clear explanation for the next generation. Other things got added. Um, I take credit for the initial protocol design. I sometimes say I invented the basement and the first floor of the, of the DNS building, and people have since put on another 15 to 17 floors, depending upon how you count. Things like dynamic update and DNSSEC. It's been hard to get DNSSEC going. DNSSEC is on the order of 15 years old now. And it's been three years to get the DNS going, and then 15 years to add digital signatures. Something's wrong. Um, and we have to think about it. Uh, and those additions either Depending upon who you talk to, in my view, they filled in the blanks. Other people thought, oh my god, that, no, that fixed the original scaling failures of the original design. But they were there, and they added to the richness of the ecosystem. One of the things I think most people don't appreciate is, you know, we defined about 60 new data types to go into the uh, DNS, along with uses for those data types. And probably only 10 of them have been really successful. So there's been a lot of failures. One way to look at it is, I wrote about 100 pages of additional, of the original specs, and there's probably 1,000 of additions that were added later. So the theory was that this is how the DNS was going to grow. What was going to happen is we'd start out with the host names and the name server records to distribute authority, and then people would add new services. So there was one new layer that was MX, which was to route email. And then you'd have other services built on top that would ramp the use of the DNS. And in some sense, that's happened. When you send email today, there's a small amount of DNS activity to route the email. 
And there's a large amount of DNS activity to decide whether or not it's spam and whether or not its origin is certified and, and it should be delivered. You actually do more DNS lookups to try and not route mail than you do to route mail, so to speak. And, but, you know, it's a database and you can put whatever you want in it. Okay, so that's a nice theory. How did that work out? The best way to understand how it worked out is, first of all, to say, well, about 10 out of 60, but what are the kind of problems that we ran into? RFID tags are one example. There's lots of different kinds of RFID out there. There's the kind of RFID that you see on door locks where your card opens the door. Um, all of the cows in North America have RFID tags. There's barcodes and there's RFID tags in cars to let you automatically change tolls. The thing that most people don't understand is, is that there's lots of different formats there about how many bits you get back from the tag. Uh, some of that's understandable because you want to be able to read the tag on a container ship from maybe two miles away, whereas when you're scanning grocery, it only has to be six inches. So some of it is whether it's powered and range. But a lot of it was there was a bunch of existing systems. There was an existing system for consumer goods. There was an existing system used by the U.S. military, one by NATO, blah, blah, blah. So how could we kind of unify those? Well, the MIT people at the Auto ID Center came up with an idea, and they said, well, okay, what we'll do is we'll create a system where there's a prefix on the number, and then there's the old code. So we embed all of the old code systems. And they said 96 bits was enough. But we needed something, we needed a database that could be distributed around the world and have millions of items in it and billions of queries and total distribution. And they came to me and they said, could we use the DNS for this? And I said, yeah, sure, why not? So they wrote a spec uh, called ONS. Um, and basically the way the spec worked is, is that the 96 bits of the tag, there was that fixed part at the front to said what numbering system you were using, but the rest of it was divided just like an IP subnet mask is divided. However, that particular regime wanted to divide it. So for example, in pharmaceuticals, it's very important to tag the exact lot, whereas perhaps if you're talking about the latest copy of the Batman book, you don't really need to know which printing lot, you just need to know which edition of the book. So these tags would be different for books and for pharmaceuticals and for airplane parts and so forth. So this went forward, and I thought this was a really cool idea, this is, this is bound to succeed. Well, no. Um, the MIT people defined it, and then they handed it over to EPC Global, which has its headquarters just down the road, or down the river, I guess. Um, I think it's in the 15th, but at any rate. And EPC Global, these are the people who define barcodes, they put it in their committee, and they said, well, no, what we need to do is, first of all, we're going to revise this, so the MIT version, which used to be version 1, it becomes version 0.5, because it's a prior version. And now our version one has a fixed three-level header. We're done. And I was in the committee meeting, and I said, well, why are you doing this? And they said, oh, because this thing that you talk about, like subnets and dividing the bits in different ways, it doesn't work. And I said, what do you mean it doesn't work? And they said, well, there's no, nobody has ever shown that the scheme would work. And I said, well, every internet host in the world shows that it works, because it uses the exact same thing. And they said, well, no, it only works for 32 bits. It won't work for 96. <laughs> um, so, you know, when I heard the prior talk, I immediately started thinking about government versus standards bodies. Where do you run into the more obtuse behavior? I'm not sure. At any rate, but it's a challenge. So this kind of didn't work, I think because it was displacing an existing industry that wanted to stay in verticals as opposed to having an open standard. I'm not sure. Another example was ENUM. Uh, the people in the IETF decided, well, we need a way in this brave new world to route phone calls, and we should put that information in the DNS. I thought this was a great idea, but I didn't, I didn't really get involved in the effort because I was off building routers, which is another story. At any rate, how did this work out? Well, it didn't. Why not? Well, you could figure out how to take a phone number and reverse the digits and encode it in the DNS, 
But it turns out people route phone calls on more than just the destination phone number. The reason you can have cheap phone cards as well as expensive service is that the cheap phone cards are using a routing code that's based upon the phone card to say, well, I want to route to this number, but at a lower level of service. Um, so Enum just didn't meet the needs of mass market routing. And it reduced the value of the expensive sort of six-figure six equipment called session border controllers that a lot of equipment providers were selling into the phone companies. Again, the problem was it didn't meet the needs and it didn't, it competed with an existing technology that didn't want to be displaced. Security. Security is a general problem. It hasn't, the security in the DNS hasn't kept up, kept up with the threats. We started the DNS in 1983, and I saw the first example of cash poisoning about seven years later. It turns out it was done by accident, but the DNS threat level has been growing. It's that yellow area. We don't know exactly where it is. We do know that when we got to the Dan Kaminsky era, and this is basically where somebody figured out how to retry a, def how to retry a mechanism over and over at gigabit speeds so that the fact that you would only succeed in breaking through one time out of 60, you know, two to the uh, 16th, 64,000. Well, if you tried 64,000 times, you probably were going to break through. So Dan discovered this, um, and that accelerated the need to go to DNSSEC. People decided, well, gee, what I'll do is, in the meantime, we'll change the way DNS is implemented so that there's a 32-bit number so that you only have one chance in 16 million of breaking in for an, uh, per try. But if you think about it, what that means is, is that when you upgrade your network to be a 10 gig network from a one gig network, you've made it 16 times faster for somebody to break in using this particular kind of statistical attack. These statistical attacks are not something that were ever contemplated in the original design and until we get to a DNSSEC or something better enabled world, we're basically still naked. Um, you know, a bunch of the open source implementations I think are kind of below that threat level if you're being attacked at a gigabit rate. Um, in a commercial company I work with called Nominum, we have some additional algorithms, but we can just slow them down. We can't stop them. We need to think about ways to create security for both the DNS and SEC enabled part of the world as well as the legacy part of the world. And right now we're just on thin ice and nobody seems to worry about it that much. Another thing that happened as DNS evolved is, is that the ecology evolved. I say DNS became DN dollar sign. You know, the, the current round of new TLDs have generated, you know, people have paid a third of a billion dollars to get to try out these new domain names. So presumably they expect to have much more. Marketing trademarks control a lot of what gets done at that top level. There's also DDoS. Uh, because of the way DNS was designed with UDP, and because you can force, forge the source address of packets, DDoS attacks are sort of the bad news in the DNS world. We have to figure out how to deal with them, and it's another case where faster links make the problem worse. If you give somebody a faster link, they can mount a more effective DDoS attack. So the environment has changed as well as, and we need to think about how to evolve the protocol to evolve with the environment. Uh, an example of the growth we've seen, and I was kind of surprised to hear somebody talking about a server that was 10,000 queries a second is sort of a, a server that should be loafing. I mean, the software quality in different server implementations varies a lot. But sort of a high-end Intel uh, box should be doing approaching a million queries a second these days with high-end software. Uh, we can do a lot more, and you know we've gone from one query per web page to frequently a commercial web pages take a couple hundred uh, DNS queries in order to validate them. So we're seeing a lot more traffic. So what do we do about this? What's the future? 
can we keep up with the, can we still use the core values that got us here? One of the core values was simple wins. I've been amazed recently at how much analysis people do on DNS traffic um, and the, the complicated systems that people have used. In fact, one of the things I was asking Vint Cerf, I was saying, Vint, do you think more people have gotten PhDs writing about DNS analysis or TCP analysis? I think I'm catching up to him. Um, there's just a lot of academic studies out there. Can we keep a simple implementation structure? Um, the reliability through replication is a, is, is a winner, although now we're, sh we're drifting towards implementing more and more of the DNS in any cast infrastructures, which I guess are okay, but sort of move the problem to the routing area, and also tend to force centralization of DNS services. Um, is that something we want to do, or do we want to try and figure out how to uh, spread them out more? And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Must be inherently fast? Absolutely. We can thank Moore's Law. Um, everything runs faster. Uh, but that has also meant that the people who are mounting DDoS attacks have a bigger weapon. And we have to think about how to allocate bandwidth. In the old days of DNS, we had a lot of open servers. And we would say, oh, yeah, use, my, use our server if you want. We're happy to help out. These days you can't do that because then people will mount DDoS attack through your open server. Um, the politics and contracts have changed as well. So when we think about re-architecting things, we have to take all of these things into, into account. Um, so the summary of the ICANN panel was here. And we said, well, OK, what are the things that are going to uh, cause the DNS to grow, and what are the things that would cause it to shrink. Uh, well, given that, it's, that you pretty much have to implement in every electronic device that's out there, it's the legacy base, and that's an advantage. Um, anybody that wants to implement an application that can talk to anything in the world has to pretty much use DNS. The flip side of that is, is that all you can pretty much get people to implement these days is things that will work with the vast majority of existing DNS implementations, some of which are fundamentally broken. One of the reasons DNS sec deployment is slow has nothing to do with DNS sec. It has to do with the fact that there's all of these routers and firewalls that refuse to pass larger packets. So people say, innovate somewhere else. Send everything through port 80. Do something else. You know, we can't change the DNS. And if it can't evolve, it's going to die. So I think one of the real questions is, how can you get that evolution done? A factor for expansion, new TLDs. I mean, the fact that these people have spent a third of a billion dollars certainly means that they're going to try and sell it to you. Um, and I suspect that some of them are going to try and do innovative things. Uh, I don't know what they all are, but I'm sure that some of them will succeed. I think people ask me whether it's a good idea to get these 1,300 new TLDs, and I say, I think so. Not so much because I believe that more than half of them are going to be fundamentally novel. I don't think that's, there's a chance of that. But it breaks down what's been about 20 years of non-introducing new TLDs and gives people room to try things out. Contraction, most of the internet devices these days are coming online are cell phones. Doesn't favor typing a, a URL or typing in a domain name. Um, voice recognition, all of those kinds of things. Why do we need any of this DNS? Um, my kids go to school here at the International School in Paris, and in their first day of computer instruction, they said, uh, by the way, you never type domain names. Nobody ever wants you to type domain names. And one of them raised their hands and said, well, our dad does. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's, it's kind of scary, because that seemed to me to be sort of forward-looking advice. And then they had the parents in, and they told me, you know, OK, the family computer should be placed in an open area, like on your dining room table. And I said, what do you mean family computer? And they said, well, you know, you're the computer that everybody in your family shares. And I go, no, no, we'll share toothbrushes first. Um, <laughs> so there, there's, there's, there's some oddities there. Um, there's commercial identifiers that would certainly, you know, your Facebook ID that would certainly like to keep on the roll, and there's big money in being the intermediary there. So that's something that I think would uh, also contract. 
the prospects of any new or the existing DNS. And lastly, I think there's one thing that I sort of really like, and that is that there's new systems from the research world that have a bunch of new ideas, and I think it'd be really great if what we do is we thought about them uh, more. The information-centric networking, content-centric networking, et cetera. So those are the factors. I think there's new challenges. Can we do privacy? It's very popular uh, with the people who run the French top-level domain, AFNIC. They've been trying to press for doing privacy in DNS. Should it be the case that people can watch what you're looking for? Um, as an example, um, it's estimated that Google sees 15% of all DNS queries. Um, the NSA probably sees more. Um, is there a problem with that? Um, you know, would you not want people to know what you're looking for? Can you put that in there? Uh, there's also content and identity and CDNs. Those are another one of the challenges out there that are, I think, new. So in conclusion, I'm going to say these are the alternatives. Um, one alternative is just a weight replacement. Uh, perhaps what you want to do is you want to say, well, as soon as one of these research projects is ready to go and we think it's solid, we ought to figure out a way to kind of make the DNS die so that that you know, will make room for that new uh, protocol scheme. Um, that's one theory. My theory is the second one which is that we ought to figure out a way to shamelessly steal the good ideas that we see coming out of the research world and from experience. And, and I'd really like it if I came back to this forum next year and said, well, we've got a critical mass of people that are going to work together about doing the next version and doing a real upgrade of what the infrastructure that we have, perhaps in a somewhat different way. Um, and we think it's time to unveil that project. So that's what I hope happens. Um, but we'll wait and see. And I think the big challenge there is figuring out what's the set of services that people need that would justify them thinking about doing an upgrade. Because without an upgrade, the task is kind of hopeless. And there's an awful lot of DNS embedded software up there to up upgrade. So thanks very much.